Yes, so we are ready. As you can see, Anthony is going to be talking about uh, photonic simulation, so photonic simulations using, uh, sorry, simulations of molecular uh, systems using photonic circuits. Um, thank you to my colleagues for inviting me. Um, so I'm Anthony Lang. I'm a, a lecturer in the School of Physics and one of the EPSRC Quantum Technology Fellows. Uh, this is my team um, who are focused on photonic quantum simulations and heavy drinkers, each one of them obviously. Um, so my talk today is going to be about some experiments that we did in Bristol um, for the past few years uh, on simulating uh, the vibrational quantum dynamics of molecules with uh, photonics. Um, and uh, I had lots of help. I was a big team over a number of years, but uh, in particular, I should name check Chris Sparrow, um, Nicola Maraveglia, who's sat there somewhere, um, Jacques Caroline, who spoke uh, on Wednesday, and Enrique Martin Lopez, who now works for Nokia Bell Labs. Oh, and this work is still under review, so please don't uh, be tempted to tweet it and, and put it on the internet. All right, so what I want to convince you of to begin with is that um, quantum interference among vibrational modes in molecules is uh, more important than you might uh, initially think. Um, so in the 60s, when lasers were first invented, chemists got really excited because they figured that they could tune the they, they could use it to break apart molecules by tuning the energy of the laser uh, to match a particular bond energy shine it on the, the molecule and the molecule would, would break apart. So it's a great idea, um, but it didn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because the uh, energy of the laser is very rapidly distributed among the molecules. It, it really just thermalizes the molecule, and the molecule does sort of disassociate, it's break off, but not the bits that you intended. Um, so work by Robitz and colleagues um, put forward the idea uh, that essentially what you need to do um, is excite a vibrational wave packet in the molecule such that after some period of evolution the energy will end up in, in the bond uh, that you want to disassociate um, and you can break the molecule apart like this. So that was a really really great idea um, uh, but it also was not com didn't work completely. And the reason is just because molecules are complicated right? and the, the, the models that we have are, are idealized. Um, so the way they got this to work in the end uh, was to have a, a feedback loop in, in those chemistry experiments. So imagine you have like a, a gas of molecules, you want to disassociate those molecules. You start with some random vibrational wave packet, so you shine the laser light on, on the molecules, um, and you get some signal which is just some proportion of the, the molecular gas disassociates. Um, and then you tweak the laser a bit more, and if you get more disassociation, then you keep sort of tweaking in that direction, and if you don't, you tweak in a different direction, and eventually you sort of optimize the, the disassociation. So I've got Absolutely no idea what this molecule is, but in 1998, Asion and colleagues uh, managed to um, show that this technique worked quite well for, for this association. Um, and those vibrational wave packets are, are exciting vibrations, vibrational modes in, in the molecule. All right, so um, another favorite molecule to, for chemists to play with is ammonia, or NH3, and what they like to do is figure out ways to knock off one of the hydrogen atoms. Um, so these are potential energy surfaces for, for um, ammonia. Um, the lower potential energy surface is the, uh, the electronic ground state of NH3, and the upper surface is the electronic excited state of NH3. Uh, the axis uh, at the front there is the, the distance between a uh, hydrogen and a, and a nitrogen, so like a local stretch mode. And the theta um, axis is what you call an umbrella mode, it's where all the hydrogens rise and fall together. Um, and 
And so what they do, what they do, the chemists, is that they sort of excite ammonia with a, a UV pulse to its electronic excited state, and it can then disassociate through one of two paths. Um, it can this a little as well. So it can, so it's on the on the upper surface. Um, and what it can do is it can it can stay on the upper surface and disassociate through this this path, um, which is called the adiabatic pathway. So the NH2 remains in the ele electronic excited state, and you get a slow hydrogen coming off. Alternatively, it can pass through this conical intersection. Um, the NH2 drops to the the electronic ground state, and you get a fast hydrogen coming off. <coughs> Okay, so now what's cool is that you can tune this branching ratio um, with a prior um, excitation, with a, with a prior vibrational excitation. So if you excite ammonia um, with an, with an anti-symmetric stretch, okay, when it's in this electronic ground state prior to the UV pulse, so you hit it with a, an infrared pulse, excite a, an, an anti-symmetric stretch, then the UV pulse goes up to the uh, excited state, you're more likely to stay on the adiabatic pathway. Um, whereas if you s excite a, a symmetric stretch, then you're, you're more likely to pass through the conical intersection. Okay, and so the, the past sort of 10 and 20 years have seen uh, increasing control over vibrational wave packets. You can now manipulate, manipulate them at uh, ambient condition temperatures, um, preparation of coherency positions on sub femtosecond time scales, um, and molecular dynamics are observe now observable on their ultra-fast uh, intrinsic time scales. Uh, and so even more interestingly, there's the possibility to control molecules now with, with quantum light. So it's sort of like the difference between a, a sledgehammer in the molecule with a sledgehammer or, or getting in there with, with a scalpel. Um, so a, a mechanical resonator has been cooled in, beneath the back action limit with squeeze light. Um, it's been theoretically shown that frequency entangled photons can enhance um, two photon transitions. Uh, and uh, recently, um, it's been shown that um, in, in the same way that you know, we can shape uh, laser pulses, we can also shape single photons of light. Okay, so it's interesting to think about the, the computational complexity of simulating these kinds of um, experiments, so simulating molecular dynamics. So okay, so if we con consider a molecule in its most basic model, a harmonic approximation, so this is where we imagine that the atoms are sort of connected with springs, and they vibrate in these harmonic potentials, um, well, that actually allows you to solve the Hamiltonian. So you, you solve it sort of quite simply as 3n minus 6 uh, uncoupled harmonic oscillators, where n is the number of atoms. And so now you might think, well, okay, that's job done, right? The Hamiltonian solved, surely that's classically tractable now, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so this is a sort of a schematic um, of a, a, a molecular vibrational modes. In the center, we have the normal modes. So those are the ones where if you, you, know, if you put it in that vibrational state, it'll, it'll stay like that. Um, and then we've got transformations to the local modes, and they're superpositions of normal modes. So if you think of sort of, so a local stretch might be a superposition of a, of a symmetric stretch and, and, and an asymmetric stretch. Okay, now think about um, the probability of having excited two local stretches to then some point later observe the, uh, the same state, so two local stretches. Um, well, you just got to do some matrix multiplication, so you times the, the local transformations, uh, u and u dagger, uh, with the Hamiltonian involved for some time in the middle, you get a transfer matrix, um, and, you know, phonons are bosons, so the, the, the probability for that transition is just the permanent of that um, submatrix. So the complexity is uh, like boson sampling, at least in the harmonic approximation. Uh, and so as we heard yesterday, boson sampling, just as a recap, is the problem of putting, um, having put uh, n photons into an m mode uh, optical circuit, trying to predict the output probability distributions, which can't be done classically. Um, uh, if, if you could do it classically, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse, uh, and that's strong evidence that such a thing should not be possible. Um, so in 2012, there were uh, four experiments that came out together, sort of showing uh, boson sampling experimentally. And then most recently, as we heard yesterday, uh, this is one from Jean-Louis Pan's group, he used the quantum dot source um, to do five photon bores and sample. All right, so obviously this is suggestive of photonics as a platform for simulating um, molecular dynamics. So um, as we heard from Jacques on uh, Wednesday, uh, this really nice scheme for dialing up an arbitrary linear optical unitary um, was given by Renke et al. Uh, in 1994. 
Um, and it basically says that with sort of a, a triangular array of max ender interferometers, you can realize any possible operation on uh, n and any optical modes. And it, it sort of works really intuitively. Um, if you imagine injecting a single photon or even laser light into this top mode, what we do is tune this max ender, which you can just think of a, as a variable reflectivity beam splitter, tune the reflectivity such that we retain as much power as we like in, in, the, in the top optical mode, um, and then we put a phase shift on it. The rest of the power comes down to the second mode. We do the same thing again, just tune this reflectivity to, to keep the amount of power they want in the next mode, and, and so on. And so you can sort of dial up an arbitrary vector on, on a laser beam or, or a single photon. And you do the same thing with the next channel. Um, and the photon that sort of goes through this now D minus 1 uh, turns into a, a D minus 1 qubit, then gets promoted up to the same Hilbert space because it then has to pass through uh, the, the first bank of, of uh, max senders. All right, um, so again, as we heard, uh, we realized this with this um, uh, silica chip, so silica or silicon dioxide or, or glass, um, which is uh, 15 max ender interferometers, um, 30 thermal optic phase shifters, can dial up any uh, operation across its six optical modes. This was fabricated by NTT in Japan, um, and they scared us all when they told us they were going to bend it in half to fit it on a six inch wafer. All right, so um, so how, how do we map uh, a molecule um, to the chip? Well, the first thing to do is to calculate its Hessian matrix, which is just the second order derivative of electronic energy with respect to nuclear coordinates um, at equilibrium geometry. Bit of a mouthful. Diagonalize that um, in mass-weighted coordinates to get the, the, uh, the normal mode frequencies, so that's these modes in the center there. Then we find the, the transformations to local modes by uh, numerically maximizing the sum of the squares of the kinetic energy uh, from each nucleus and then and then we just sort of so then we end up with a, a unitary matrix which is sort of time dependent it's just saying you know what's the for some for a particular time step um, that matrix will give you the, uh, the the transition probabilities from input to output modes and so we can just map that unitary matrix um, for a particular time step to the phase shifters in the optical chip uh, so this molecule is H2CS, or phi or formaldehyde, um, and um, so this is a, the first simple experiment. So what we do is um, the waveguide in the chip that corresponds to uh, a local stretch mode um, has one photon injected into it. We then dial up uh, a number of unitaries that correspond to a sequence of time steps for the evolution of this local mode. And this plot is just saying, okay, having, excite, having excited a local stretch mode, what is the probability to find um, the, uh, the energy still in that local stretch mode? And you see it sort of oscillates. So <coughs> dotted line is the theory plot and the, uh, the points of the experimentally taken data. Um, and we don't have to, you know, if, if you want to simulate sort of uh, 300 femtoseconds in the future, you don't need to do the whole 300 femtoseconds, right? You can just sort of jump straight to that time step. So here we show the evolution on sort of two time scales. One is the um, short time scale, and then here we can sort of zoom out a bit and, and just look at sections um, across the 300 femtosecond um, time span. And things get a bit more interesting when we inject multiple photons uh, into the chip to simulate multiple excitations. Um, so we just use the state that comes out of an SPDC source, which is sort of a two mode squeeze state. So think of a superposition of uh, one photon in each mode plus two photons in each mode, um, which maps to uh, one photon in each stretch mode, or sorry, one excitation in each stretch mode, or plus two excitations in each stretch mode. Um, and this plot on the left is looking at the probability to observe um, two uh, uh, excitations. Um, so the, the, the black line is basically saying, okay, what's the probability to find the state that we, init that we initialize? That's uh, uh, two excitations in, in each stretch mode. Blue line is saying, what's the probability for, for those two excitations to pass to, to bend modes? And the gray line um, is saying, okay, what's the probability to, to transition to a bend down a stretch? Um, and again, the lines are theory and, and, and the, the points are experimentally taking data. And the, the plot on the right is just the same thing, but for, uh, for twice the energy. For, for a four photon experiment. Um, then you can imagine, you know, given the complexity of boson sampling um, for, for many photons, this kind of simulation would be hard to simulate classically. Um, so we can dial up 
these kinds of simulations for any four atom molecule uh, that you can conceive of. So I've got really no idea what these molecules are, but we chose them because they've got very different geometries and um, it seems that the sort of the more connected the geometry is, then the, um, it has a, a, the more connected the geometry is, then the slower the oscillation time scale is. Um, so these sort of strongly connected uh, molecules at the top have these slow oscillations, whereas at the bottom where it's less connected, we have these sort of really rapid oscillations. All right, so, so far that's sort of been, um, those have been simulations in, in the idealized model and the harmonic approximation model, but in reality, um, you know, molecules um, lose energy, they interact um, uh, with other molecules and with different degrees of freedom. Um, and so here we sort of simulated that process in, in water, um, simulated the thermalization of H2O. Um, so, the, uh, so H2O can thermalize by its, um, its stretch modes either decaying directly to the, to the ground state, ground vibrational state, or via um, bend modes to, to the ground vibrational state. Um, so this is, this is an open system now, so it needs to be modeled uh, via a, a Lindblad equation. Um, we put these decay constants into the Lindblad equation, um, and instead of getting a unitary out, you get a non-unitary, um, uh, which is, um, <laughs> uh, so they're the time-dependent Krauss operators. Um, but you know, what we have in, in the lab is, is a unitary, so how do you, how do you implement sort of non-unitary uh, matrices uh, with the unitary? Well, there's this trick called unitary dilation, which says that you can embed any matrix, I mean, even a matrix of zeros, um, in a unitary twice the size. So water has three, vib three vibrational modes. Um, so we, you know, we're dealing with three by three matrices, and we can embed those in our, and we can embed any three by three matrix we like in our six by six um, unitary, experimental unitary. All right. So, uh, so what we did here was to uh, simulate um, uh, having excited a, a local stretch mode in, in water, watching that decay by um, transition to the uh, the other stretch mode, which is the gray line. Um, and to the bend mode, uh, and then eventually everything after a thousand twenty seconds um, goes to the ground state. Okay, so um, again, uh, trying to get to sort of more realistic models, um, the, you know, th those plots that I showed of NH3 earlier on, those are sort of really complicated potential energy surfaces. So what we wanted to try and do is to get to a bit more of a, of a complicated potential energy surface. Um, and that really involves, you know, including anhelicities uh, in in your um, simulations. Um, okay, so to do that uh, again with water, um, we include as uh, as well as the Hessian, we include third order terms and semi-diagonal vortices. Then use perturbation theory to include a nonlinear term. Um, so what that really means is that um, so and. An, Okay, so if we look at these potential energy surfaces, the, the, the dotted line is, is in the harmonic approximation where the energy, um, the, the energies are all sort of equally spaced. Now, when you get an, an unharmonic potential, um, as you get further up, the energies get closer together. What that corresponds to in, in a photonic chip is that, well, you know, if I put one photon into a waveguide and it gets an, an alpha phase shift, I was in the harmonic approximation, I put two photons in and they get like a two alpha phase shift. Um, but the non kind of non-linearity non I want for, to simulate the unharmonic approximation is that two photons get less than a two alpha phase shift. Um, so when we put that into um, our model, what that actually translates to is um, sort of uh, mode coupling in the um, in, in the molecule, which we can simulate with photon-photon interactions um, through measurement-induced nonlinearities. So as well as so the, the simulation that we want to do is, is two excitations in a local uh, stretch mode of H2O, but we also need to um, sort of implement this nonlinearity is an ancillary photon. Um, so we sort of break the chip in two. Half of it is um, the 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 water molecule. Our ancillary modes uh, allow us to implement this measurement-induced nonlinearity. Um, so what we see is in the in the anti-bunched case. Um, so the, the probability to sort of to observe two local stretch modes. Um, the difference between the harmonic, which is the dotted line, and the unharmonic cases, not that different really, there's just sort of a phase of, of offset. But including these anhelicities um, in, the, in the bunched case, where, we, where we're looking for sort of the energy um, for, for two excitations in a, in a local stretch mode, where you expect to see the, the effects of the unharmonic potential, um, it's really marked the difference between the unharmonic and har harmonic cases. Okay, so finally what we wanted to do was to um, 
sort of uh, mirror the, those NH3 experiments that I showed early on and sort of uh, use our statistics uh, with a machine learning algorithm to design um, an initial state um, that could lead to a sort of preferred disassociation pathway. So what we want to do is, is say, okay, well, over 10, 20 seconds of evolution of, of, uh, of ammonia, give me an initial two photon state that maximizes those two photons going to a local stretch mode and minimizes those, sorry, those two excitations going to a local stretch mode and minimizes those excitations bunching in, in any other mode. Um, so this is sort of the procedure. We uh, initialize the um, algorithm with a random, uh, random state of two photons. We then implement a unitary that simulates the, um, the upward lift from the, the electronic ground state to the electronic excited state. Uh, some period of evolution, so 10, 10, 10 femtoseconds of evolution. Um, take time steps over those 10 femtoseconds. Um, and then measure on a local basis. Uh, feed those statistics back into the algorithm and then up update the state via an Elder Mead sort of machine learning algorithm. And, and then try to iterate toward the optimal, the, the, in, the initial state that's optimal um, for for those statistics, so okay. So th this plot in the bottom here is 400 iterations, um, and what we see on, on in the lower bar charts is a, an evolution over 10 femtoseconds. The blue bars are the ones that we don't want, so those um, are, are bunching in non-NH stretch modes. Um, and as you can so as the algorithm starts, we sort of get lots of this, but then toward by the end of the algorithm, uh, those blue bars have disappeared. So after 400 iterations, they've all but disappeared. We see the red bars, which correspond to um, bunching in NH stretch modes. And uh, the yellow bars are sort of benign. They're just anti-bunch states. They, in, in our model, they wouldn't lead to disassociation. All right, so um, challenges, obviously, um, are, are to try and engineer so, sort of more complicated photon photon interactions to get to these um, more realistic potential energy surfaces, and of course to get the, uh, the photon losses down, so this is a picture of scattering. Um, but you know, the, the possibilities um, are designing new quantum, con designing um, control fields for um, quantum uh, states of light, or, uh, finding new association and disassociation pathways, and just in general simulating molecular quantum engineering. Um, the slide that I want to leave you with uh, is a painting um, done by Eleonora Martorana, um, who's a graduate of the um, uh, Royal Academy of Fine Arts and also the partner of uh, Raphael Santigatti, one of our uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, she was inspired by this work to, to do this painting, which is acrylics on cardboard. What she imagined is that the, the, the chip is now a, like a cinema projector, but instead of projecting sort of classical light, it projects quantum light. It projects this movie of a, of a ammonia molecule disassociating. Um, it's got these reels on the ground there because you know you, you can load any any reel into the into the, the projector and simulate any molecule you want. Um, and we both have daughters, and so this is one of our daughters who's going to be a scientist of the future, uh, using our chip to do quantum chemistry. Right. Thanks very much. Amazing stuff, really interesting. Um, I haven't really thought about it too much, but what, what is the coherence length of a, of a phonon in one of these? And, uh, how does it, do you have to map that in any way to, to your experiment or think about what it is in it? I'm not sure what coherence length is sort of. Or like how, how long, or coherence time then? How, how, time. how long is a, a phonon coherent? Yeah, so it depends what temperature they're at, so uh, at low temperatures. Um, I think I showed a plot where um, the, the sort of the coherence peters out, but it's it's getting toward 100 femtoseconds before it's sort of, before it loses uh, coherence completely. Mm. <coughs> On the back. A great talk, Anthony. Is there is there any work on getting rotor dynamics into these simulations in the? No, um, um, no. We we sort of um, disregard those in, the, in these simulations, but um, yeah, it might be one of those things that. Uh, eventually, we want to include in, in the simulations. Time for another question. I do have one. Don't mind. So, what do you think is the 
What do you think is the uh, technological change that has allowed all these to happen? And what's the next bottleneck that has to be targeted to move forward? For the, for the simulations? For the simulations, yes. For the simulations, um, you know, the big one is um, photon loss. Um, you know, so I thought, okay, there's, there's this plot um, from uh, last year which sort of shows uh, so along the x-axis we've got photon number and along the, the, the y-axis we've got photon loss um, and it shows the, the regions of sort of quantum, you know, where we need to get the losses and photon numbers to get a quantum advantage versus a quantum supremacy. Um, and you know, so the ballpark figures are like we want to get the, the losses beneath 50%, so we want to get transmission probabilities above 50% per photon. If you can do that and get above 20 photons then you can get into the regime of quantum advantage. Um, but to get a quantum supremacy, which is where you sort of un unquestionably outperforming a, a, a classical computer so you know, th there's no tweaks that you could do to the classical computer that would um, that would sort of get that back in the lead um, then you need to get upwards of, of 50 or 60 photons. Uh, just to sort of clarify the difference between a quantum supremacy and a quantum advantage um, so in, in this picture you symbol has a, a speed advantage and in this picture it has a speed supremacy <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and on that note, let's thank Anthony again.